have put this ship in very good hands at the helm, and I, I really am excited to um, see where they're going to take it. So I wanted to start with that. Um, and the next thing I wanted to say is that I think that Julie has a couple of items to add to the agenda during the updates. One has to do with um, the uh, FIS uh, grants, and the other has to do with FIN. Um, so with that, the next is, does anybody um, have any other modifications to the agenda, and is everybody okay with uh, the agenda modification I just listed? Okay, seeing no opposition to either of those. And the next is uh, the meeting minutes were provided to you in your meeting materials. Um, does anybody have any changes, modifications that are needed to the meeting minutes? Okay, seeing none, we will move right along. Is there any public comment? Okay, seeing none. Okay, our first item on the agenda is a subcommittee uh, funding subcommittee update um, by Julie. If you'll recall, there was a motion back in April um, to amend the step down language in the RFP to say up to 33%. Um, so between this and the 75-25 split, the, the funding subcommittee met over the summer to talk about that. And I, you know, you, we are going to see as we have discussions going forward in this meeting, there's some work that they're going to have to do um, upcoming over the over the next year. So I'm going to turn it over to Julie to go through that. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the recommendation that came out of the funding subcommittee that went to the coordinating council during um, the conference call, and thank you to everybody that was able to get onto that conference call. Um, I can. Is that is that better? Okay. That's okay. Thank you. Um, the recommendation was to leave the, that all of the maintenance projects would abide by the year 5 33% step down um, and that the 75-25 split would remain for FY20. Um, the funding subcommittee also had a number of discussions on the future of the 75-25 split and that group decided that it was best to ha continue to meet so they will be reconvening in the January-February timeline to discuss the 75-25 split. The coordinating council recommended that at the joint meeting the operations and advisors also discuss this issue so there are a few things that came out of that discussion. Um, the first is that the Joint Committee looked at potential what the step down was going to mean and realized that at this point it's somewhat difficult to determine what the future of funding in the next couple of years would look like. So they are recommending to keep the 25-75 split but also note emphatically that the 25% is a minimum allocation for the new projects. It's not a maximum allocation. Um, they did also recommend that there's only a single year of new funding and then projects would move into four years of maintenance funding and that all four years of maintenance funding would be used to calculate the step down base. Uh, they also discussed the potential for project caps or funding ranges wherein a project that had a large expenditure would fall into a higher range and therefore would receive a lower score. Um, these are ideas that they were putting forward to the funding subcommittee for discussion at their January February meeting. Does anyone have any questions about those discussions? D. Lupton. One of the items that was talked about in the uh, conference call that we had was if money was left over on one side of the 75 or the 25 split that it could be available to the other. I, I recommend that you know when the funding committee um, make sure that that's in the uh, decision document to clearly specify that. Okay, we can um, make that so. Thank you, Dee. Are there further questions for Julie? Okay, seeing none. The next um, item on our agenda is to consider um, 
the recommendations for the funding um, proposals. And you all have in your meeting materials, and this is going to be on pages 35 through 37. You've got the proposal rank rankings by the operations committee um, and by the advisors. And the third table is the average of the two. And as always, we have um, that uncertainty in our funding level where it could be 3.35 million or it could be um, three and a half million. Um, and I think, I'd actually, Alan Lothar's here. If, Alan, do you have any insight for us on, on funding levels for this year? Uh, so most likely it'll be the same as last year, we would assume, which was the, which was the 3.35. But then we did get an additional um, 60, uh, 63,000 to bring it up to like 3.413, so just over 3.4. So, and we expect that that, addi that additional funding will continue, but we don't really have any guarantees yet. So, that's that's our best guess right now. All right, thank thank you. That that gives us something to um, direct our conversation, Bob. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just before we go too far into funding conversations and, and all of this, I just wanted to let everyone know that the ACCSP grant that ASMFC has with NOAA Fisheries is on, we're about year 3.9. So we've got about a little over a year left. And as we normally do, as we sort of wind down these five-year grants, um, we're kind of working right now, Laura and her staff are looking kind of to scrub that grant and see if there's any money that's left over and could that we'll need to spend out by the end of February in 2021. <clears throat> so there is the potential that, you know, we had a number of vacancies that were left uh, open for a little bit longer as we went through the leadership transition in ACCSP and, you know, a number of other things that may, may have resulted in underspending in a couple areas. So they, you know, we'll get that done in the next few weeks and we'll be able to report out to the leadership of ACCSP, you know, what what, if any, is available above what we anticipated. And then I guess the process will, will need to be set, you know, so what? What do we do with that money? How do we, you know, and I'm not suggesting it all necessarily goes to these projects. There may be some in-house things that take priority, but I think, you know, we'll, we'll need to work with the chair and vice chair and Jeff and, and sort of come up with a prioritized list of how to spend that money. If there is any additional money available, I'm not saying there will be. I, I, I anticipate there may be a bit. I don't know what that means exactly. But, you know, as we get into this, just, you know, there's one more variable that after these decisions are made may affect sort of downstream how much money is available, which may free up a little bit more to help out with some of the decisions today. But we're not going to know that today. We'll just have to work through the leadership and then get back to the coordinating council after the fact. Thanks, Bob. That's that's good to know. I know we had some conversations offline about looking through the administrative grant and so on. So that's that's good to know. Thanks. Um, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to have Julie summarize the um, findings of the operations um, committee. We have Nicole Langell as the operations chair up here, and also Jerry Morgan from the advisors, um, who could help answer any questions if needed. Um, I do just want to say a quick word up front about um, Maine's proposal. Um, it was a high dollar um, number. Maine is in a pretty tough spot. Um, and so it's, it's a, you know, in turn, it makes our conversation, um, you know, we're going to have to figure out a way through it. And I really want to thank Maine for working with us on this. We did catch up with them. Um, before this meeting to brainstorm some ideas and talk through some things with them. Um, and so they'll have a presentation to show you what sort of deliverables they can achieve at different funding levels. So, you know, the worst case scenario would be the 3.35, um, and then the highest scenario would be if, you know, miracles happen and we found all the extra money, we got 3.5 million and some fees were um, waived. So, so they're going to um, go through that after um, Julie goes through uh, through the proposals. And then, as a reminder to you, I'll be looking for a motion at the end of this conversation. So, with that, take it away. Thank you. Um, so, the, I'm going to just move to the next one and um, try to blow this up as much as possible. So, the project names are just short. Um, sentences or short 
phrases that are helping to indicate what project it is without being the full name so that it's a little bit more readable. Um, we've included the partner and then the first column of numbers is the cost of the proposal. The next column is the cumulative cost with the NIMPS fee. I just wanted to point out that this should be taken with a mild grain of salt and that's because this is across the board a potential of this is what the NIMS fee could be, um, but we spoke with Alan earlier today. There is the potential that the NIMS fee might not be in place for the southeast, um, and so if that happens, that could be potential extra dollars that are included if there is no NIMS fee for the southeast. Um, so that column in particular is a little bit nebulous right now and is subject to um, change in the next couple of weeks as things move forward. The next two columns are just the amount remaining in that group, whether it be this slide, which is maintenance, or the next slide, which is new. Um, and that's based on a 3.5 or a 3.35. Um, as Alan indicated, we're probably somewhere in the middle at a 3.41. But again, with NIMS fees, it's a little bit changeable. Uh, are there any questions? Again, the, these are actually done in order. The rank is not here on this slide, but it is in your materials, and these are in order, uh, with the top being the highest rank. Any questions for Julie? Okay, so moving on to the new part, uh, new projects. Um, again, this is the rank. Uh, the columns are all the same, so I'm not going to explain them again. Um, and as you can see, the red there is indicating the uh, funding deficit. If we, if we were to fund all of them, we obviously don't have enough money to fully fund everything. Um, but this is the same as the previous slide in terms of columns. Uh, does anyone have any questions for any of us about the rankings that came from operations and advisors? Kathy Knowlton. Not a question so much as a clarification with regard to what Dee said earlier, just so everybody understands, and I'm understanding correctly. If you go to the previous slide above with the maintenance funding, um, anything, if we were to receive more than about 3.4 or 3.45 million, then there, anything in the extra in that second column from the right would then be applied towards the new proposals. That's correct. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kathy. So I'm going to say that another way, I think, is that any money that is um, left at the bottom after we get through the maintenance proposals does get rolled over into the new proposal area. That's, that's how it works. Are there any other questions? Uh, Brandon Muffley. Thanks, Madam Chair. Just in, I just had a quick question in regards to the maintenance. Uh, proposal rankings. All of them rank generally about the same except for the main uh, Mackerel and Menhaden uh, project. I'm just wondering what the reason was for the really, well, at least comparative to the other um, proposals, why that proposal ranks so low. I mean, I, I know that, and I don't remember the differences like that in the past, and I understand maintenance proposals have a different sort of ranking process, uh, these simplified ranking processes, but it just seems to stand out quite a bit with how different that proposal is. Yep, I will turn that one over to Julie. Um, so there was um, there what we'll just consider a clerical error um, in Maine in that when they submitted their final proposal um, for um, after corrections, they submitted last year's final proposal. Um, and so the final proposal for this year as corrected was not available for ranking. And so the group felt as whole that it was too late for Maine to resubmit that and make everyone read it at the meeting. Um, so they ranked it based on the fact that it had been cler a clerical error, um, which they recognized does happen, but people were obviously a little more harsh with their rankings on that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Julie. Any other questions? Okay. With that, I think the next step then, we're going to move on um, uh, to Maine. Um, are you guys ready? And we'll uh, see what they got. Sure. Uh, do you guys have the slides that we sent you? 
Perfect. Um, all right, so we uh, have had some calls with ACCSP given that it's unlikely at this point that the new project would be fully funded. So we are asked to provide some information on what can be accomplished under partial funding levels. Um, so hopefully that will become clear in this presentation. And then we had also pulled together an Excel sheet in a more thorough presentation for the meeting materials. So hopefully people were able to take a look at those. Next slide. Um, so the three funding levels we were asked to look at were the 82,000, 200,000, and 300,000. Um, and just a reminder on what we're focused on in the proposal, the nuts and bolts. Um, we are trying to support the implementation of 100% lobster harvester reporting um, through the lobster FMP and addendum 26. We have a deadline of 2024 to achieve that. And then with the recent right whale discussions through the take reduction team, it seems like that could get pushed up, um, and so we're trying to, to work on this now. Um, the proposal includes funding for nine new positions. Many of those are in the data and reporting field, I'll say, um, but there are, all, all are also a few licensing staff since our reporting and licensing, um, they do interact. Um, and it also looks at leads enhancement, and I will explain what that is on the next slide. All right, so at our first funding level, 82,000, what could we accomplish? Um, so the first thing that we could do is move forward with our necessary leads enhancement. Leads in the state of Maine is our license enforcement and environmental data system. It's where we store all of the Maine DMR licenses as well as scanned paper landing reports. And it's also what we use to manage reporting compliance. Um, and it's proposed that the enhancement would automate this harvester compliance, and we feel like that will save a significant amount of staff time down the road, particularly as we're trying to move to electronic reporting through this proposal for the lobster fishery. Um, also at this funding level, we could hire a harvester reporting coordinator for three months. Um, that position, or through that funding for three months, that position could be kind of trained as to what the reporting would look like in the state, become familiar with our rules and regulations, and kind of just get someone on board. Um, what we cannot do at that funding level, we would not be able to implement 100% lobster reporting by January 2021. Um, so we would have to continue with another year of the 10% harvester reporting, which is what we currently do. Um, and this is because we cannot hire and train the full complement of staff that's in the proposal, and we don't feel like we could provide industry with the level of customer service that is needed. Um, and this is something that the department has really focused on, uh, customer service. I think we feel like we have one shot to get this right in moving to 100% harvester reporting, um, and there's already a bit of reluctance within the industry, so we want to make sure that uh, we get it right when we do it and we provide the services that are going to be needed to make sure it's successful. Next slide, please. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, at the next funding level, we looked at what we could accomplish with 200,000. Um, and just to orient you to the slide, the blue text is what we could accomplish in addition to what we did under the previous funding level. So at 200,000, we could still move forward with the leads enhancement. We could hire that harvester coordinator for now nine months instead of three months. And then we could hire one additional staff halfway through the funding cycle, so we're saving half on their yearly costs. Um, again, bringing these people on board will help um, get them up to speed before we move uh, in the direction of uh, higher reporting. What we are not able to do under this funding level is pretty much what we could not do under the previous one. So we don't feel like we could move to 100% lobster reporting by January 2021 because we're not hiring the staff that's needed. We don't feel like we're gonna be providing the level of customer service that's needed. Um, so we would do another year of the 10% harvester reporting. And then the final funding level we looked at was 300,000. Um, so again, we would move forward with leads enhancement, hire the harvester coordinator for nine months, and under this option, we could hire three additional staff halfway through the funding cycle. So the, the pattern here is the more money that we receive, the more staff that we would hire. Um, what we would not be able to do under the 300,000, 
Um, we would not be able to implement the 100% lobster reporting unless there was some sort of future funding that had been identified and secured. So we're really only able to make that commitment for 100% reporting if we're able to secure a second and likely third year of funding at the 600,000 level. Um, and under specifically the 300,000 level, we can't hire that full complement of staff. And as I mentioned, that will impact customer service, audits, and outreach. Uh, so I think that's the full presentation. I'd just like to give a shout out to Rob Watts who put this information together. I'm really just the messenger here today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Megan, for that. So with that, are there any questions for Megan about these various funding levels and what they can or cannot do that will help guide us in our discussion about approving the proposal funding? Jason McNamee. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, um, one question, so um, I think, I think this goes to you, Megan. Um, you had mentioned in a couple of spots it couldn't implement the 100% reporting by 2021. Um, isn't there more in the FMP? There's, of course, you know, it should happen as quickly as possible. It's important, but um, I guess what I'm trying to make sure is there's not an FMP compliance piece on top of this it isn't there is more time beyond 2021 per the FMP is that right okay um, yeah I believe under addendum 26 it's January 1 2024 that we're required to move to 100% harvester reporting when that addendum passed it was a five-year window from the implementation date um, but it is likely that through the take reduction team and the take reduction plan that we will have a requirement for sooner than that. So that's where the compliance may come in. Are there any other questions for Megan? Lewis Gillingham. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is, if the funding remains static for the five-year period, do you move forward with each year, or are you held to what you can do with, say, $200,000. Thank you. So I think I'm understanding your question. I think um, we would have significant troubles moving forward with 100% harvester reporting if we just had the 200,000 um, moving forward just because we don't feel like that will support all of the staff. Um, obviously, it doesn't look like we're going to get the full funding through this proposal, so we'll start to look at other funding opportunities and where other pockets of money may exist. Um, we have talked about trying to like, uh, roll some of that money over um, so that we might have a larger pot down the road that we could draw from. Um, so I think that's maybe something we could still consider, but um, taking that leap to the 100% harvester reporting is really going to require a larger amount of funding. Okay. Our D. Lupton. So I'm just going to put this out there. If, we, if you get money this year, which, you know, I'm, I'm actually supportive of, but if you get a smaller amount, you start the, fin the funding decision timeline. And according to the current document, which could be modified, that after your first two years under the new category levels you out for the next four years. So strategically, would you want any money this year and hope for the step down next year, which is another 33%, would make more money available to new projects, a la Maine's project, which would start you out at a higher level. So in the funding process over the next six years, you're at a higher level and maybe can achieve 100% reporting. I'm just, I just want to put that on the floor. I've heard various things. Um, the other way, the other thing is if you get some money this year, to, if the Coordinating Council approves money. It, would your scope change drastically? You know, if you only get 200,000, then your scope changes, and then if you get submit something next year, is the scope change enough to be considered a new project again at year one? I'm just throwing out various options for consideration to try to get something for Maine for consideration under the current guidelines. Uh, Megan, where do you want to respond to that at all? Do you have any? 
If I could, I'm not sure I'm going to respond to all of it. Um, but no, that was actually a question I had is about the the two year um, being like the the new baseline. I'll say for future decisions, I would if we could have a conversation on that. I think that would be great, whether that's today or at a work group meeting or however you guys see fit. Um, I think that would be something for us to talk about. Um, in terms of like waiting till next year to get potentially a larger pocket of money or deferring our proposal till next year, um, I mean, we got a fairly low rank number this year on the proposal. Um, I'm not sure if I see like a, and, and perhaps I'm wrong, I wasn't at that meeting, but I'm not sure I see a reason for the rankings to substantially change next year from the same individuals. Um, and I get it's a large pocket of money, so there may be some incentives for people to rank it lower um, because it's really benefiting one state. I, I do recognize that. Um, so I'm just not sure if the outcome would really change in another year. Okay, I'm going to turn that over to you, Jeff. To <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Um, procedurally, the, the choice is up to Maine as to what they can get done. Um, with partial funding this year, and then, of course, it's up to them to submit for full funding or partial funding next year. Um, there's the funding subcommittee, which is we just covered and is going to meet again in January, February. That was a mix of the operations committee and um, coordinating council folks, including Bob Beal. Um, and they might make a few adjustments and decisions on what is in the RFP for next year, but in the grand scheme of what are ACCSP funds intended for, what is available, and are there components that Maine has put on the table at three different funding levels that would move them forward towards lobster reporting. So it, I think it's a fair question about what is the strategy of first year funding, two year funding, getting something in place. Uh, the read of that that I have on the proposal and what they've put in front of us is the the changes to the lead software, the development of their own app with different funding, uh, and the beginning of staffing is up to the council to consider uh, if that moves the fisheries reporting in general um, down the line. But from a procedural standpoint, it's up to Maine as to would they want to accept partial funding this year, and yes, they could put in a full proposal next year. Thanks, Jeff. So given that, are there, are there any questions or further discussion on the, on the main proposal? Okay, so seeing none, I think what, what we are gonna need to do here is um, we're gonna need to have a motion to approve the funding recommendations. We've heard from Alan Lothar about the funding situation, so we're gonna to have to bear in mind that uh, we ought to be prepared um, for that lower funding level. Um, if that happens, uh, we are likely gonna need, if the lower funding level happens to be clear, we are likely gonna to need to convene the um, what was the executive committee, which I think we all believe is now titled the Management and Policy Committee, um, to uh, go over um, and reach out to the PIs and, and work through to a solution. So with that, is there, um, can I ask for a motion on the floor? Kathy Knowlton. All right. <clears throat> uh, submit a motion to fund all maintenance proposals as ranked in the FY20 average proposal ranking spreadsheet. Second by Jay Magmy. Is there any discussion on the motion? Megan Ware. It's just a question. Um, the discussion was brought up about the two years being the, the new level that you're based on moving forward. Is it possible to have a discussion on that in the upcoming uh, January, February? I don't know if that's the right spot, um, but if it's just possible to put that as a discussion point moving forward, I think that would be helpful. Sure, and I'll send that over to Julie. Do you want to respond to that? Um, yeah, the Operations and Advisory Committee had a similar discussion about um, the calculation of base funding, and they have recommended that the funding 
funding subcommittee discuss one year of new funding, four years of maintenance funding, and then the calculation of the base being done on the four years of maintenance funding. So that is on the slate for the funding subcommittee to discuss in January. All right, Kathy Knowlton. <clears throat> All right, had a little bit more to add to that um, for the full motion. Uh, first sentence, following the 75-25% split between maintenance and new proposals, just for the record, need to have that noted probably. And second motion, fully fund the three highest ranked of the four new proposals for the new proposal from Maine, fund the portion of the proposal with remaining new funds. Uh, so, Jason McMe, since you seconded the motion, are you are you okay with this modification as it stands? Yep. When it says remaining new funds, does that include any total remaining funds? So any that would potentially. Yes. Carry thank over you for that clarification. Five? It probably should just say fund with the remaining so. available funds. Madam Chair. I think it would also be appropriate to include, separate from the motion, the comment about um, a funding shortage and the deciding body being our illustriously named ACCSP Management and Policy Committee, as well as Maine's request for a specific note relative to resolving the number of years and how the base funding is calculated. I think that would be an appropriate place. So are you asking to add that to the motion? Not to the motion, just notes yep. for proceeding forward it's yep, a procedural it in my I, mind. I believe that it is on the record okay thank you yep yep okay so now we have the emotion slightly tweaked are there any questions at all on the motion as it now stands okay well then I'm gonna read it into the record um, this is to move to fund all maintenance proposals as ranked in the FY 20 average proposal ranking spreadsheet following the 75 25 percent split between maintenance and new proposals fully fund the three highest ranked of the four new proposals for the new proposal from Maine fund with remaining available funds motion by Ms. Knowlton second by um, Dr. McNamee and with that uh, we'll try to do this uh, the easy way is there any opposition to this motion all right motion carries very good Okay, so with that, we're going to move on to um, our next agenda item, which is, oh, yes. I just want to follow up on the discussion that will come about the future years and how this gets handled. And to me, part of it is what constitutes a project. If Maine were to get two, $300,000 and do parts of what was proposed this year and then propose doing more next year, they could come in with essentially two projects potentially doing this work over a number of years. Or as it would be considered that everything that's encompassed in the universe of this initial proposal sort of always stands as that project no matter how it is funded in bits and pieces maybe in future years. So I think that needs to be part of the discussion if something that comes in like this really big gets divided up into multiple projects, how would that be viewed given like, you know, Dee mentioned the comment of coming in later years, and I think that needs to be part of this discussion for managing this in the future that we can have in January, February. Yeah, thanks, John. Those are good <coughs> comments. You know, there, there really is. I, th I think the funding subcommittee has a fair bit to talk about, you know, and there's the sort of overarching philosophical um, thought about um, how much, you know, how much money is appropriate? Should we talk about caps or ranges of caps um, going forward? So they're they're going to have a lot to uh, a lot to discuss going forward. And Kathy Knowlton, did you have a comment? 
Yes, just the, to direct the funding subcommittee to have a specific review of the language in the funding decision document that incorporates significant change in scope of work. We already have an allowance in the proposal process that would allow for a partner to um, present change in scope of work, but only when it's, I think, in the first two years of the new and we usually preclude partners from doing that in all these many years of maintenance. And if they are requesting a change in scope of work, we ask that they be very clear about it and why. And I think that shows the flexibility of this process is that we don't want people to skip telling us about things. Just tell us the truth, tell you what you need. And the operations and the advisors have their process with the ranking system, but the coordinating council has always had flexibility to take into account special needs and special issues. So for me, even though this example of Maine's proposal has a very big price tag, we've accommodated this process before. We have had regional proposals that have very large price tags. Um, back when I was much younger and Rec Tech was submitting for these huge increases for Atlantic Coastal work, we could do that because the money was available. And then we started you know, decreasing it. So I think the process is already there. The process works. Just ask the funding subcommittee to try to articulate the definition of what a scope and change is and give the partners the freedom that they need to make those requests through the process of the proposals. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Jeff? I just wanted to add the idea of with different projects being able to clearly define different deliverables. So the one thing that they pointed out in this first year was the modification to the leads um, software. That was something that would be a one-time cost that was pointed out during the operations committee meeting and during our discussions um, in preparing for this meeting. So um, I guess that was that comment. And just before we move on, I do want to thank uh, Maine for their work uh, and their time that they put into this. One of the things that we wanted to do uh, and have therefore put in front of you was options of what would actually be accomplished at different funding levels. And that took uh, some extra work on their part, but hopefully allowed you guys to make a little bit clearer evaluations of what can be done at this point with uh, a little bit more information on, on what the deliverables will be at different funding levels. So thanks for the extra work. Okay, great. So with that, we will um, go ahead and move forward to the next agenda item. Um, it has an action on the agenda. This is an idea. Oh, and yep, my mistake. So we have one more, um, one more slide for Julie. Just wants to talk to us a little bit before we move on about the step down. I promise this will be my last slide with numbers. Um, well, at least ones that have dollar signs on them. So the re purpose for this slide is to just. Um, take a look at planning for our future funding. Um, and this is a reminder from two important aspects that the maintenance projects are going to have to be stepping down again. And so uh, this slide has a circle around the maximum available year six funding. So if you're a partner that has one of these proposals, it's really important to take a look at the available funding that's going to be out there and ensure that alternatives are being sought after. Um, and the other point on this is that even though the 75-25 split is going to be in place, we've already discussed heavily the idea that that split is just a starting point and that money can be moved if overages can be moved from one side to the other if possible. That very likely means that there will be overages um, there, are, there will be underages essentially on the maintenance side. So there's going to be money on the maintenance side that will very likely be available for new projects. So partners should be keeping an eye toward potential new projects for next year's funding cycle. And I know it seems early to be talking about that, but it's never too early to be thinking about those kinds of things because it happens very quickly. Thanks, Julie. Okay, so are there any questions there? Just a, basically a reminder that as we work through this step down, there is going to be um, funding available for new projects. So, you know, go home and do some thinking. Any questions? 
Okay, see, now, now we're really gonna move on um, to the agenda item about the um, revising the structure of the technical committees. Um, as I was saying, there is an action by this item and the action that's desired here is not to make it happen right away, but um, what we're looking for is an endorsement of this idea from the coordinating council, basically a green light to um, staff to let them go and um, gather information and really do a little research on what this might look like and bring it back to us um, to present the full idea. So with that, I'll send it over to you, Julie, to talk in more detail. Thank you. So the proposal that, that was in the charge in your meeting materials um, is to combine the existing technical committees such as the biological and bycatch committee, commercial and recreational committees, information system into a large technical committee um, that has work groups that would follow those topics but also follow other topics. And the driver behind this is that with a large number of technical committees, we're asking for a lot of different staff members, which can be a burden on the partners. It can also be a burden when the same staff member is assigned to multiple committees. Uh, we're also finding that as we move toward integrated reporting and move forward with our various modules, there are far more things in the ACCSP domain that cross sectors. It's very difficult to have a conversation in the commercial technical committee about the gear codes that it doesn't also affect the recreational technical committee and the information systems committee. And to pass that same item from committee to committee to committee is a very time consuming process and it slows down our ability to implement things. So we are looking for a way to solve some of those inefficiencies. This is a proposal that was put in front of the operations committee. They felt that it was worthy of investigation in the information gathering phase, but wanted to ensure that this group also felt the same way before any uh, staff or partner staff time was spent on investigating this. So none of the committees have been briefed on this because we have not done any information gathering at this stage yet. So that goes back to... Um, <laughs> that goes back to turning right. So, <laughs> uh, so that turns back to the way that Lynn summarized the action at the bottom. And that's the summary. Great, thanks, Julia. Are there any questions about this? All right, Jay, Jason McNamee. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Madam Chair, in fact, it, um, I don't know if you want me to, I was gonna kind of offer some comments. I don't know if we're in question mode right now or. What, what do we, so Kathy Knowlton, did you have a question or more of a comment? All right, let's go to Kathy's question and we'll, we'll come back to you. Kathy. Sorry, Jay. <laughs> um, I, I'll admit to being I know this is only a request for our approval, but I did find it difficult to give an opinion without more information. So I know you were in a, a chicken and egg situation with that. And in hearing you say that it's often for some of the agencies, the same person that's on more than one committee, what about the flip situations when I think for many more of the partners, there is a specific person that's a subject matter expert for that technical committee that is on only one committee, maybe two, but only one. So moving forward with your data gathering, is your intention for it to be a giant super technical committee where the people that have traditionally been, for instance, at my agency, RecTech is one person, ComTech is one person. There's a lot of overlap with ComTech and the codes and some of the issues that pop up through some of the subcommittees. That, that makes sense to me. But it's also another person that does bycatch and biological. Those three people are very distinct in their job responsibilities and knowledge. So are you saying that we would then be pushing forward in that situation to have the one person representing it all? Because in that case, there would be a loss of technical knowledge and I would look forward to seeing how you all incorporate those scenarios in. We also have little buggers like travel restrictions. So that's sort of a, not so much a policy or a directive, but a technical component in how you get from point A to point B. 
if you have a situation in your home state, hypothetically, where you have to justify more than one person going to a meeting, it's extremely difficult. And so my question to you all would be to see if there could be, as you move forward with information gathering, sort of a hybrid to this idea, where can you utilize specific components of sort of this super committee through webinars and conference calls when you have updates and things that incorporate more components of them, but save the truly technical issues that are very different and require a different person <laughs> to still split out and have technical work groups. So you could call the whole thing a technical committee where you fold everybody in, but knowing that you're still gonna have items that require work groups and conference calls and in-person travel, because as much as everybody loves MRIP and hearing about it, I imagine there's quite a few commercial folks that don't wanna be involved in a day of that and vice versa. So I really look forward, I, I appreciate the idea and having staff time be used more efficiently and effectively, get it. So thanks. Do you have a answer to the question? <laughs> Uh, the answer is yes, we have thought about all of those things. Some of them were discussed at um, the operations and advisory level of what do we, how, how do we want to structure it. Some of us thought of the idea of, you know, uh, the way that a uh, CDAR data workshop works where there's a plenary session, everyone gets together and then the work groups can go do their own thing where they really get to be experts. Um, but state travel is a consideration there because it would be multiple people and that's something that you know we need to bring back and forth and see if we go that way instead of you sending three people to three different meetings can you send three people to one meeting it, what what is the appropriate venue so those are all excellent points and I wrote them all down so that we make sure we incorporate them in our conversation thank you Julie and our, uh, Jason Magami why don't you go on with your comments Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I was kind of having a, a similar um, thought process to, to Kathy. And so first I'll start by saying I endorse the concept. I, I think it's a great idea. I looked at the kind of myriad of committees over the years and, and wondered, you know, uh, about the structure a little bit. And so I, I like this effort to try and think about it. Um, when I was reading the document, though, a couple of things struck me, um, the, the little the memo that you put together, and I just wanted to make sure, uh, I just wanted to make a few comments, because I started to question a little bit of the incentive for doing this. Um, and so a couple of the, the comments in the memo had to do with efficiency, and I like efficiency, it's great. Um, but it's when you're working with partners it's messy business right and it's important to make sure that being efficient so I'll just offer a, a really extreme example if um, I was on a technical committee if everybody did what I wanted to be super efficient right um, and so we have to work with each other to you know think about the challenges in Georgia versus the challenges in Rhode Island and, and hash through those things. So, uh, you know, I don't want to lose the notion of collaboration and partnership on these committees to efficiency. And I think it's going to be important to, um, you know, keep that, keep that in mind. And maybe I was reading too much into the memo. I'll, I'll acknowledge that. Um, so the other thing, there's a part in there about um, these kind of volunteer ad hoc groups that, that come together, and that's really cool. That's what companies like Google do. You know, they do these kind of um, teams that come together for special tasks, and I, I think that's um, another good, good approach. However, when it, co when it comes to volunteering, just from my experience on other technical committees, you could end up with the same people doing everything. And, and it's not fair to those people. They're, they're proactive and they wanna be involved and they wanna do work, um, but there needs to be a little bit more thought into keeping the partners engaged and not just going with the people that raise their hand every time because that's in their nature to raise their hand every time. Um, so 
you know, be cognizant of that. And then final point, thank you, Madam Chair, is um, I wondered, again, a, another kind of hybrid type of idea when I was thinking about my staff and how they participate on the ACCSP panels, I kind of saw not one mega, um, I, I like super, super technical committee, uh, super mega technical committee. We, feel free to use that one if you like it. Um, but maybe there, there are two. I, I saw kind of like a biological, you know, like the bio and bycatch group. They seem to do kind of different stuff. And then you've got the dependent uh, reporting group. And so I wonder maybe if it's two rather than, than one. Um, so just something to, to kick around while you're thinking about this. But in general, I, I support the concept. Thanks, Jason. Are any, Megan Ware. Thank you. Um, kind of building off of what some of what Jay was saying, I can definitely see from the memo that there's ways we could streamline how these groups are interacting right now, and I think that's a good idea. Um, coming from the ISFMP world, they have had to deal with a lot of work groups in the past couple of years, um, and I think there's been some outcomes of that that may be counter to what you're trying to accomplish. So I. From my personal opinion, I feel like the work groups have actually increased the staff workload because there's not been a clear person who's like the leader or the modeler or something like that that has like an assigned task. Um, and also, as Jay mentioned, I think you get the same people on the work groups, so you have a small group of people that can be overworked through that style. So I'm wondering, has ACCSP talked with ISFMP staff about some of these challenges that have come up with work groups. I think they're workarounds, but just like knowing some of the challenges that have come up might be helpful. Thank you, Megan. Um, it, are there any other questions or comments about John? Has there been discussion of how the work groups would function relative to the full committee for making decisions? Like, is it the type of system where all the decisions would be the responsibility of the full technical committee. So if you use the CDAR example, the plenary makes all the decisions, the work group provide recommendations and don't, or is that the kind of details we still need to think through if we endorse just the general concept and then hammering out all the particulars over the next year or so? Julie. Uh, thank you. The, yes, that is something that is still being worked out. The idea that, and again, this is the idea that we were throwing around in our heads that we have not investigated or discussed with, you know, even the technical committees. Um, but the, yes, that would have to be something. The idea of the work groups is essentially that, you know, there might be standing work groups that are topic specific, but then there, there would be the ad hoc ones where we would say, okay, the safest redesign is a short term project. So we need a, pro a group when the redesign is over, the group would go away. Um, I appreciate Megan's perspective, and I think that's a great idea to t talk to the um, ISFMP staff, and I did take note of that um, because that is a consideration. So I think everyone's had really great ideas today, and I think that as we talk through a lot of these ideas with the technical committee members, they'll be able to provide detailed perspectives that will give us um, good fodder for a more solid discussion to bring recommendations back to this group. Yeah, thanks, Julie. So before I try to sum up, is, are there any other questions about this? Anybody have any more questions or comments? So, you know, this is a, it's, it's a big idea, and I know that a lot of people, I really appreciate the deliberative discussion. So um, what I would say is that there's some more work to do in developing this idea if this body is okay with that. So really, I think the question before us is, are we on board with staff um, developing this and, and really laying it out and bringing some options um, back to us to decide whether we want to proceed? And that would, of course, involve engaging closer with the, with the technical committees themselves. So. With that, I, I guess I'll just ask, is there, is there any objection to um, staff going forward with an information gathering phase? Okay, seeing none. John. And Julie, I think that you know, everyone recognizes the challenges and you guys have laid out 
a good case for looking at the structure with the whys. We've heard a few more things raised here today that should be considered. But I think it would be good to go to the technical committees with just the question that was on the plan of how can we adjust the structure to address the challenges and maybe not seed them the idea of doing a super committee, but see what they come up with. Each one may come up with various hybrid approaches and different solutions. You know, if they're not sort of told, well, we, these are the problems, we're going to do a super committee, what do y'all think? They'll focus on either beating that up or supporting it. Give them more an open-ended, so how would y'all fix these challenges? Yeah, thanks, John. That's a, that's a good approach. Um, okay, so I think we have, um, we have resolution on that, and we're going to move on to the next agenda item, which is to consider the establishment of a data coordination committee. Um, this one, I think, began evolving uh, at last year's annual meeting. Uh, and, and really this is about developing a way to make sure that all of the various efforts and initiatives that are happening, happening across uh, different agencies um, are connected to avoid um, overlap. I think John um, Carmichael had some pretty elegant examples of that at our annual meeting last year. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Jeff. Excellent. Thank you, Lynn. Um, as we have on the slide and as Lynn introduced, this was discussed last year uh, as how do folks better, better discuss projects that kind of have effects cross-jurisdictional. So uh, the quick summary is that integrated reporting initiatives, um, which have typically been regional, uh, highlight greater need for coordination. And so uh, the, one of the items there last year was CFIRE, the Southeast for Hire uh, Integrated Reporting, and how that was a lot of the federal partners working on it, the, some of the states wanted to be involved, and how the data flow would work, uh, and ex figuring out a broader range of how that project would um, move forward and how else it would affect others. One of the things that really hit home was how reporting in the South Atlantic for a duly permitted vessel uh, or, or entity in the Mid-Atlantic would now have different uh, reports to address. And the end goal of one report going to multiple agencies was kind of the idea that it, it covers more than just the one region uh, that those things are meant to address. And on the flip side, um, in the summary that was sent out over email last week, there are some other examples that start more at the, at the state level that may require changes to um, other reporting systems and whether that was uh, the TATOG uh, commercial landings tags, uh, American, Lice, American Lobster gear, uh, and vertical lines. There's an initiative, which I'm not sure how many of you heard of, but it's, the, it's a um, one-stop reporting project. Um, and these are all activities that are more inclusive within a region, but sometimes the recognition of how it affects um, partners not in that initiative, um, be that a state or, or a, a further region, are not, not included. And so the charge was really to provide a cross-jurisdictional forum for sharing information on data collection initiatives. And so that might be a relatively informal three to four conference calls a year uh, to share projects that are up and coming, regulations that are around the bend, how that might affect data collection and other things. So this morning at the Lobster Board they talked about we've got this need for a data item. It can be put in one, two, three different um, data reporting flows but if it's not on the paper form or it's not in this other primary application, how do we consolidate the data at the end of the year? How is it useful to management as a holistic view? So getting a little bit more lead time and sharing these are the projects, these are the successes. Maybe it's an outreach item. Maybe it's a data collection item. Maybe it's a technical issue. But being able, having, being able to share those things uh, would, be, would be pretty useful. And so that's where the idea came from. Um, we've even had a couple of, uh, and it's, it's a little off the list here, but a couple of successes um, recently where we were at a meeting that the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission and, and, and PACFIN was also at, 
they were very interested in how ACCSP website confidentiality worked for you for the for the data warehouse and we were able to begin sharing those tools with them uh, and that was kind of a the idea here of a data coordination committee be able to share projects share information and move things forward and so with that um, I'd certainly entertain any questions but the the proposal on the table here was uh, consider approving the data coordination working group and tasking staff to request members via email uh, the intention again would be to not really have it as a voting group uh, everybody still has their own regulations and needs to meet uh, but knowing that we're all on the same uh, with have the same end goal of coordinated data reporting uh, by creating this group again non voting group but more of a sharing membership will be open to um, all of the state regions councils feds uh, the folks that were uh, interested in involved in this uh, and I think the tie back to the integrated reporting is is with greater data flow from more various places that's flexibility that's really necessary in the data collection world but when it all lands at one place and that choice has been more and more ECCSP which we're proud to be there uh, being able to share the different requirements early enough with folks so that it all comes into the same standards is really what this was after so um, with that I'll entertain questions sir who I apologize I do not know your name <laughs> yeah hi Tom Neese New England Fishery Management Council executive director uh, thank you yeah I, I don't show up a lot but when it's 10 minutes from my house it's hard to find an excuse not to come <laughs> Uh, I thank you mr. madam chair I, I got a question for Jeff I, I guess I'm a little confused it it seems like this group to be effective is going to have to involve many of the people or represent many of the groups that are sitting at this table and so did was there any thought to considering that maybe the way to address this is not to form another group but to include some sort of information sharing agenda item on a periodic basis at this meeting we could certainly do part of it uh, at this meeting the intention was really somewhere in between uh, it, it's choosing the right people somewhere in between the operations committee level uh, the technical committee the technical folks that have the the IT knowledge and the policy level so my um, time is precious at these meetings um, and I think the ability to delve into the issues and consider what's up and coming and figure out the so whether it's a database piece or a reporting piece uh, I'm not sure there would be enough time uh, to follow through on that in this particular forum um, if we wanted to handle it more at the operations committee level and bring in uh, people then initially that makes some sense as well uh, Mel Bell thank you madam chair I was just gonna ask so you envision one one person from each state uh, and we just designate who is that the and, and it being kind of an informal improved communications that's what this is about the intention was one person per you know agency if we're having all these via webinars and conference calls certainly more people can participate and learn from it that would be fantastic that's the intent of the group um, in the event that we needed to have an in-person meeting I would uh, expect that uh, budget would dictate limiting membership a little bit more or limiting travel uh, D Lupton so the way I looked at this it very it sounded very much like the operations committee and a new task to the operations committee because at least in our state that's probably who would sit on this committee so I was having some trouble with we were wanting to streamline the technical committee aspect but create a new co committee that may be somewhere between policy and technical which was operations to me so I know you know not everybody may have that person on the ops committee but I, I was just wondering if you had considered adding it as a task to the operations committee and maybe even have maybe additional meetings but just have those additional meetings via webinar focused totally on data 
coordination and not all the other operations items. Yeah, thanks, Dee. Um, before I sum up on that, um, Jason McMe. Yeah, so I had a very similar comment to Dee, so I won't restate that, but I, I'm also struggling a little bit to, um, so Jeff, when you were kind of leading into this, you gave some examples that made sense to me, like lobster, there, you know, we talked about that this morning. And so that would, is that how this would work? You kind of pick a topic and, and kind of figure, it's such a huge thing that I'm struggling to figure out how you'd kind of focus in and get to a, get, get to the output, you know, to, um, so that, I'll stop there. No, nope, fair question. And it, in the in the summary, um, it did have kind of an areas of interest. Uh, my my current thought would be you'd pick a call and say, we've got dealer reporting, whether that's online or, mo or or tablet apps. Let's talk about that today. Get a couple of folks to prepare presentations and focus on that aspect and how that is what upcoming initiatives there are going on. Uh, the trip reporting is kind of the grill in the room about how this came about and, and is one of the primary tasks uh, for next year with the different initiatives that are happening. Uh, but it could go to, um, you know, the other, the other thing might just be, let's talk about regulatory changes that might impact existing data systems and leave that as a, as a two hour call. Uh, so pick a topic, feed in a couple of, um, seed presentations of a major initiative and get folks to talk about it, what other things are happening in their agency. Thanks, Jeff. So are, does anybody else have any questions or comments on this? Okay, so I'm actually getting the sense, I, I think um, following on the comments we've heard from Dee Lupton and others that I, I think the way to handle this would be to take it back to the operations committee and maybe discuss it with them and above all we need this to be useful and we, we certainly don't want to committee ourselves to death. Um, we want to make sure that we are uh, communicating well and not duplicating efforts. So um, that would be my proposal if that yep. suits staff yeah so so is there any objection to sending this back um, to operations committee and having them talk about it as a task for them okay seeing none that's what we shall do so with that we're going to move on to um, the update portion of our agenda we're doing well on time we'll try to motor through this and get to uh get on so go thank you lynn um and as we get into the program updates, we did structure the agenda. Uh, thank you again for the beginning of the meeting and kind of the um, work of the selection committee and choosing myself and Julia as deputy director to keep us moving. Um, under the program activity and highlights here, I did want to highlight a, a couple of approach items and then give you guys in the sense of, uh, you know, transparency and a little bit more information on some of the initiatives that we've been involved in and some updates that have occurred over the last, since your last meeting, really. But internally, we've certainly been evaluating and focusing on our existing commitments. So what, are, what is the focus of our resources and the core issues that we need to address <laughs> internally? One of the first things that we needed to do was fill some open slots. So we had three open positions, uh, two kind of were defined uh, early this spring, so adding a person to the data team to work on biological data, uh, replacing our um, outreach program coordinator with a program assistant, and then uh, backfilling the recreational team lead slot. And as an update for you guys, we've been we've actually had those positions out. We've interviewed for all of them. Uh, we need to complete a couple more interviews before we make our selections, uh, but we're uh, glad to be kind of bringing, bringing ourselves back up to full staffing. Um, another thing that we've worked on is really expanding our internal program management and greater integration with ASMFC. Uh, we've been functionally a part of the ASMFC family since the decision in October of 2016, uh, but based on when the 
ACCSP strategic plan ran out, when the new ASMFC uh, strategic plan is out and the action plan, this is actually the first year where the action plan for the year is fully integrated into ASMFC. And so that was a process that we got to be involved in, involved Lynn and John on, um, and of course that document is going to be coming out later this week um, through the Administrative Oversight Committee. And so it's been good to be a, a part of that process and um, begin kind of regular coordinating council leadership status calls uh, to keep coordinated on, on what these issues are. So those are some of our approaches and it, it just points out that the, the 2020 ASMFC action plan uh, goal three is really focused on ACCSP and we were glad to be uh, taking steps towards that integration. The other items on the list, we've got slides for each one, so I'll step into those. Um, FISMA, so the Federal Information Security Management Act. Uh, Mike was able to give you guys updates in the past on how this was proceeding. Primarily, this was growth of ACCSP security systems and the interaction with the federal systems and a task that was necessary to document and move forward with the uh, CFIRE data sharing and data collection. Um, and so we've had a several meetings with them between the director, uh, staff, our contractor support, HMS folks, uh, people from GARFO and CIRO, and primarily with the uh, Office of the uh, OCIO, so the um, Office of the, uh, Inform the Information Officer at, at NOAA. We've kind of given them an overview of uh, the ACCSP and the partner reactions, and they got, received a commitment from them to help support this process. Uh, the FISMA process can be long uh, and is primarily documentation, so it, they were able to define us, the ACFIN, Atlantic Coastal uh, Fisheries Information Network, as moderate but non-federal. Uh, that is a similar classification as the NIMS regional offices, and this was a benefit uh, to us in the process because based on the levels of classification, there's certain levels of documentation. This puts us at a lower level um, of documentation and, uh, and security risk to federal systems. And the bottom bullet is really just a technical document that, that guides us through this. And the overall process here is really two major things. We had an uh, external security scan that was done. We passed that with, um, very, with no high criticality, um, no, uh, only a couple of medium and a few low uh, priority criticality item or you know, configuration changes that we needed to address. And that means updating security <laughs> protocols and software version changes, some operating systems on a couple of servers. And that's really considered a short-term completion, and we're on track to support CFIRE, probably have most of those things done by the end of November. It also includes things like extending, uh, it's kind of a in-the-weeds thing, but the two-factor authentication, when you log into your banking software, uh, it sends you a text message back to make sure you're the right person. So um, adding that to the safest tools, not for every login, but when you initially create your account or when you um, to request a change in your password. It goes back to the two-factor authentication. So there's a technical development there. We had part of it, we had to develop another part of it um, and not be too onerous, because we're trying to walk that line between maintaining security and making the tools easy to use by fishermen. So that's not a two-factor thing of every time they log into the app or every time the data gets submitted over the API. Um, the, but those are some of the um, initial configuration changes that we've been in the midst of doing. One of them that's complete at this point, moving all ACCSP laptops to Windows 10. That alone, because Windows 7 is going through lack of, um, or end of support, January of 2020. So those kinds of things take months to implement. They're already in place at this point. We've already got the servers and things configured, so we're moving well along in that path. The second step of this takes a bit longer, and that is to document and evaluate the security procedures. We use something called the Cybersecurity Evaluation Tool. Uh, it's a federal tool based on Department of Defense. 
and it goes through a whole roadmap of about a year and a half uh, to get through all of it. That is an on doc ongoing documentation and confirmation process. So once you have the procedures in place, you have to test them every once in a while. Um, the security scan that we had gone, that was done for us through an outside vendor uh, contractor basically said, you're doing a lot of great stuff. We need to tighten up the documentation so that we can check on it every once in a while. That documentation, of course, involves pulling a lot of old things together, uh, writing a couple of new policies. Um, and thankfully, we have enlisted the help. I think you were uh, informed before of Joan Palmer. Uh, she retired as lead of the Information Technology Group in Woods Hole and uh, still considers helping us out in these things fun, which is fantastic for us. Uh, so we appreciate her help as we go through this. Um, so with that, that's a, just a, a quick update on where we are with FISMA and why it's important to not only maintain security and protocols, but to be able to move forward on these, um, on some of these data collection initiatives with our regional partners. Um, the next item on the list, and uh, Julie and I are sharing some of these, uh, is the FIS projects. And as our lead on FIS committees, I'm gonna have Julie go over this slide. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so we have two projects that have been funded that FIS is a um, PI on. The first one is to utilize quality management tools um, to improve data provision in ASMFC stock assessments. This is actually building on a quality management project that was done in the southeast. The basis behind this is simply um, using the quality management special, professional specialty group. Look at that, Alan, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Um, the tools that they have available in their facilitators to help us walk through the process of how the data are being provided to the stock assessment to help us find any efficiencies so, so that that process can go as smoothly as possible and provide data that is high quality but is provided in as quickly of fashion as possible, which is always an ideal scenario. The next one is development of one-stop reporting that Jeff mentioned earlier. Um, electronic vessel trip reporting technical specifications. Um, this one was actually, I will say, spearheaded by Barry Clifford at Garfo, um, but he very wisely brought in um, the Northeast Fishery Science Center, the Southeast Regional Office, the Southeast Fishery Science Center, HMS, and ACCSP, all as PIs. So this is really truly a coastal joint effort. Um, and once those meetings start to convene, there's gonna be quite a lot of discussion amongst various partners. Um, so we're very much looking forward to that project. The final project um, is one that is not one that we will be receiving funding for. It's one that the Gulf States um, has proposed, but they are gonna be transitioning to tablet-based APIS data collection. Um, as you all know, that is something that we do on the Atlantic coast, so ACCSP will be um, sharing software on our base configuration. So um, while we're not directly receiving any funding for that, we will be um, heavily involved in that project and that we're gonna be um, sharing our information and Jeff and Alex will very likely um, get down there on site and work with them on that project. Um, so those are the FIS projects that we have um, officially received funding for as of a couple weeks ago um, for next year. So uh, we're looking forward to participating in all of those and welcome any questions that you guys have about them. Are there any questions? Any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Okay, so the next one is just an update on a meeting that we participated in. Uh, both Julie and I got to go to the FIM meeting. That's the Federal Information Management Modernization uh, meeting. This was uh, middle of September. And the objective here was really to discuss NOAA and partner, uh, including the FINS and the commissions, uh, data needs, and develop actions to modernize the information systems. This was great because they had 40 or 50, probably a few more than that, um, folks in the room worked out through facilitated sections. It was um, 
a follow-up to a net gains report on how to modernize and improve the underlying systems, the data sharing, and how, uh, and how it all moves forward. So this covered a lot of areas, including weather information. Uh, it's all of NOAA, uh, and it really. And so it covered data buoys, uh, fisheries independent surveys, camera work, electronic monitoring, as well as the, the part that we were involved in as uh, fisheries dependent uh, data collection. And so as you see, the bullets on here were some of the outcomes. And surprisingly, a lot of the thoughts going into the meeting were, oh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, way cool technology, move it all to the cloud. And in the discussions, it became really clear that there might be some, of, some aspects that are really built for that. So moving the data buoys into one cloud in, it, that is shared by NOAA instead of having three different regional uh, areas that do that. Sounds like a great idea. But a lot of the items listed here talk about communication being crucial, uh, sustained funding, partnerships, uh, essential to successful fisheries information management. And so time and again throughout that meeting, the experience of the FINS, um, ACCSP, Gulfin, PACFIN, ACFIN, um, as being able to both self-evaluate that external systems were doing a pretty, pretty good job of, of moving forward on modernization tasks, as well as provide opportunities for engagement and partnerships to make sure uh, that things are moving forward. So one of the highlights here on, on partnerships was really recognizing the annual data load, uh, which Julie will talk about and has, has really led for a long time. In 2007 was something like 40, to 45 individual data sets to try and compile. That number's come down a little bit to somewhere about 30. But the partnerships of knowing what data sets exist and how you find them and how you get them to the central place so that you can manage the data seems to take a lot longer than the actual data management part. And so that's where uh, this work group was really, uh, or workshop was interesting to be at and talk about those types of things, the sustained support both from uh, leadership, funding, coordination, and partnerships was really the message that came back out of it. And it was great to not only be uh, invited to that workshop, but to uh, be able to sit down on a couple of the panels uh, of, of what the discussions were and, um, and see kind of that national perspective. So that was uh, another kind of activity that we participate in, uh, and it's been pretty great. Um, along the same veins, just thought of another side one. Um, Julie went to the American Fisheries Society meeting this year and helped host a data management training class, continuing education class, and was able to, over a four-hour class, one of the things that folks weren't sure is, oh, is that too dry? How many people are they going to get? They ended up with about 20 people in the room, a couple of walk-ins, uh, and they were so interested in the exercises, both students and you know, long-term veterans that they stayed about an hour afterwards to finish the exercise and figure things out. It's like, oh, I thought Excel was a database. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> and, and how do we organize and, and, and work on our data so it lives beyond our project? And so teaching those kinds of things uh, out to other people and sharing is, is kind of a neat role that um, in, in smaller areas we get to share and do. Um, and so that was another, uh, another highlight. The next slide talks about GARFO FDDI, and you know, we love to throw all the acronyms out, but frankly, the whole explanation didn't fit on this on one line. So, <laughs> it's the Fisheries Dependent uh, Data Initiative. This was uh, really led by GARFO. They've been doing this uh, for years, and including ECCSP when it was ended with a V for visioning. Uh, they're moving to the um, the implementation or uh, phase and it's really about a regional plan for integrated data information systems, uh, improving, modernizing, and integrating fisheries dependent data systems following the uh, federal and regional standards. 
So that's organized as an oversight, a technical, and a regulatory team. They have asked uh, ASMFC and ACCSP to be part of that. So um, Julie is on the technical team, and both, uh, where's Tony? Oops, both Tony and I are on the regulatory team, and I'm also sitting on the oversight group. Uh, and the entities are listed up on the screen, but it's really about all of the fisheries dependent things that are happening in uh, and through GARFO, the d website data products, the trip reports, biological sampling, uh, the pre-trip notification systems. But there's a, there's a variety of things happening and to be able to work with them and sit in on this for the partnership between what data comes through ACCSP, what data comes in through them, what data products are necessary, and being able to work on that jointly uh, is, is a great thing, and we're glad to be part of that one. As, as I said, they're just forming those groups, and uh, some of the first meetings are, are coming up later this week. Oops. Sorry, Kathy Nolan, did you have a question to this point? I do. Is there a version of that FDDI for the South Atlantic, or has there been a corollary recently that produced that kind of outcome? I'm going to ask for a little help here after a moment. Uh, <laughs> um, the closest analog that I'm aware of is really the CFIRE group and the time that they spent to, to come up with the for hire uh, reporting piece. Uh, Again, this is the data coordination committee idea comes to support things like this and discussing what are the initiatives, what is it across regions. Um, there's been, since that idea was brought up a year ago, there, there's of course been, been progress on these kinds of ideas. Uh, but if there's a Ciro or South Atlantic rep here that wanted to expand further, then that would be great. Well, there is a South Atlantic rep here, and I think you summed it up. There isn't as much going on at least that we're aware of it doesn't mean that there aren't things going on within the center perhaps that haven't trickled out to our knowledge but not sure of things going on um, there has been some discussion going back and forth among folks at the council coordination committee which is the chairs and the eds about some of the regional implementation plans on on that's crossing over into some of this data stuff and what's been shared and there seems to be a lot of variation across the different regions nationwide as far as how much has been shared and how far along they all are. So as Jeff said, that was kind of, I think, the data coordination committee idea was to be up at that level, at least maybe get the different regions on our coast talking a little bit more and sharing ideas. Oh, go ahead, Julie. I, I just wanted to say it's a small part of it, but that is, a, an, an objective of the OSR FIS project. It, it, I mean, it's a small part of that FDDI effort to be doing those kinds of conversations, but, you know, CERO and the Southeast Fishery Science Center are in those conversations. So hopefully those kinds of conversations, along with some of the other ones that we're having on just some standardization things that I'll talk about on the next slide, will start to maybe spur thoughts and on something more formal. And with that, I think we're ready to move to the next slide. So back to Julie. So there's a, quite a few bullets on this slide, and I just kind of want to touch very briefly on each one um, to take the opportunity to either give you a little bit more information on them, um, and in a lot of cases, thank you for the um, efforts that your various agencies have put into them. Uh, the spring fall 2018 data load, which happened this year loading the 2018 data, was an exceptional year. We managed to be a few days early for the spring load. We were able to deliver those data on April 12th instead of April 15th. Uh, we also set an internal deadline for the fall load, which is not um, as public or as crucial, but we actually managed to be about five days early on that one. Um, these don't seem like huge numbers, but it is super significant because it is the first time ever that we've been early on the fall load, and it is very rare that we are 
um, on time or early for the spring load. So being early for both of them says a lot about the efforts of not just our staff, but especially all of the agency partner staff in making sure that we got data in a timely fashion. Um, everyone was meeting deadlines and getting data early and that was very, very helpful to that process. So please go back and thank the folks that are involved in that process. Um, the next item is the PRFC data feed. And this is a data from the PRFC have usually come to ACCSP. Oh, oh, sorry. That was my bad. I accidentally pressed my button. I, I faked Caitlin out. That was my bad. Um, <laughs> the PRFC data have normally come to us through uh, VMRC and we have not able to have uh, data coming directly from PRFC. <laughs> And this year we were able to work with PRFC. Um, their staff did a great job as long as well as their contractor, Ray, I believe is his name. Um, he did a great job in helping them do some programming. And so we're in the final stages of testing and we're gonna be getting data directly from PRFC. And that's a big step forward on our staff. We're very excited about that. Um, so we wanted to kind of recognize them for the work that they did on that. And I keep pressing the button, I'm sorry, Kayla. Um, so the HMS data feed, um, it is a fairly complicated data feed as it seems like everything with HMS sometimes is. Um, but we are working diligently with their staff on trying to get a final data feed into the data warehouse that compiles um, all of the data, which is very tricky because there is overlap with the Gulf. So we're actually pulling in data that actually goes from Maine to Texas. Um, so it's been very difficult, but there's been a lot of people working on that and we've been very appreciative of those efforts as well. Uh, the next one is the new public data, new public queries in the data warehouse. If you've been on the public data warehouse lately, you'll notice that at the end of each row, there is a new field that tells you uh, the percent displayed. There was some, um, unhappiness with the original direction of the new data warehouse and how the public data warehouse was displaying data. We were attempting to show true coastal totals, which meant that in some cases, if one state was confidential, we ended up hiding all the state data at the state level. Um, and that was not desirable. So we kind of flipped everything on its head. We now show if it's non-confidential, the state data is shown. And then as we roll up to the region or as we roll up to the coast, we just make sure that you can't back calculate anything that we didn't show you at the state region. Um, obviously that means that there are some regional and coastal totals that are redacted totals, which means they're not true totals. So that is that new column at the end where it will show you how the percent displayed. Sometimes it's over 95% of the data. So it's actually, depending on your activity, still a usable number. Um, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback about that. If you have any feedback, we would love to hear about it. The next item is confidentiality and FIN coordination. We've worked very hard on the um, automating our confidentiality. Um, as Jeff mentioned earlier, we did have a conversation um, with the PACFIN, ACFIN folks when we were at the FIM meeting. Um, they were very interested in it, so we did a demonstration for them and we've started sharing information with them um, about how they can do that. And they were so excited by the exchange that they now wanna start having um, a FIN meeting every once in a while. So they volunteered to um, host the next one to demo something that they are doing um, in their fin for the rest of us. So we're gonna involve um, Gulf fin and Westpac fin in those as well. So uh, we're gonna start having these occasional fin show and tells so that we can learn a little bit more about what the rest of us are doing. Uh, the data request volume is actually up um, over the last year and a half. So we kind of wanted to share that there's been a lot of data requests. We're averaging about a completion of anywhere from 10 to 12 data requests a month. Um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but some of them are fairly involved. Um, we were talking to someone earlier about all of the data that's being used in the Ecopath um, preparation in the South Atlantic. That's just one data request. 
So it took a while to figure out all the different 140 species groups and manually code those in. So that's something that would only count as one data request. Um, code standardization has been an activity that we've been working a lot on. Um, and when I say code standardization, in this case it actually doesn't mean what we normally think of it as um, in terms of standard codes committee, although that committee has been doing a lot of work lately. Um, what we're actually talking about more along the lines of is like the common names standardization. We did a lot of going through to make sure that those were being displayed in a consistent fashion so that it's always things like snapper comma red. Um, so that it is easy for everyone to find and it's consistent across all of the various commercial, recreational, biological data sets that we have. Um, the common names alone was a process that ha took about two years to do and we just completed it. Um, and there's been a lot of partner involvement in that. So we appreciate everybody's um, patience and response to emails and queries and look at this really long list. Do you see any issues? Um, everyone has been very responsive to those and we appreciate all the cooperation. Um, finally, I wanted to let everyone know about the biological module progress. That was a activity that we had had to set aside because of staffing issues. Um, because we are able to now bring someone else on, we have started working on that. Um, so we have new structures in place that we're testing various codes and things on. And we've also, and we've started to work with partners um, to sort of beef up the existing data and do some quality checks on it before we move it in. Um, and again, we've reached out to partners with some pretty old lobster data and said, hey, what does that mean? Um, and people have been really helpful in, you know, digging back in their records and figuring out what those things mean so that we can get them clarified before they get moved over. Um, so essentially the, you know, theme of the slide is there's a lot going on, but everybody's been really cooperative from a partner standpoint and that's made for a lot of successes and we are very grateful for that. Great, thanks Julie. So just checking out, are there any questions at this point? You know? Okay. Go ahead, John. Excellent, thank you. And update on electronic trip reporting status. So the, there's a long list of items on the screen. I won't bore you by reading all of them, but the whole point here uh, is that there are several different electronic trip reporting uh, initiatives that are going on right now. They have overlapping uh, data fields, timelines, and um, needs. We as ACCSP are involved in many of them uh, along the lines of um, what's going, what's happening here, and then of course the two bottom issues, the safest redesign and integrated reporting, are part, all, part of all of this. So um, in addition to this list, Several states have electronic options as well, uh, some using SAFIS, some other systems that are becoming more widely used. And I uh, point at uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, Maryland, and South Carolina that all have uh, you know, trip reporting, both commercial and for hire, that go through these, uh, these types of things. So the, the grand dream of the one-stop reporting is the, uh, either the Olympic ring or the Venn diagram piece of saying if you have multiple permits, uh, then the system will know about those permits and ask you all the right questions on one trip report so that it will, they say, add the extra um, economic questions for you if you've got a South Atlantic and uh, Mid-Atlantic permit and then still include um, if you happen to encounter an HMS species, the extra target species uh, and the individual fish information uh, that goes along with that. So that's the dream and that's part of what the, um, the safest redesign and integrated reporting are working towards. And um, again, the trick is to collect all the right data elements for each jurisdiction, uh, even when there are multiple permits. And so with that, I'll just kind of step through a couple of what the parts are of SAFIS uh, as in today. Uh, a couple of reminds, next slide please. Um, and a little bit about, a little different perspective on what the redesign means. Um, I keep hearing some different uh, perspectives on why it's been going on so long, where, where are you at now, when are we going to see something at the end user perspective at the end. So, um, Safest today includes a bunch of different modules. Uh, the, tr the initial 
Uh, big one was really the dealer reporting that was online. Not only is it online, but it allows file upload from third-party systems. And there's now um, EDR uh, mobile, uh, or a tablet-based, which allows dealers to both either, either use a swipe card um, to identify the fishermen or use it out on the dock and carry it back inside to complete the report, uh, that kind of thing. So there's multiple pathways to get the dealer reports in, um, and it includes uh, the one-ticket system that's, that's functional down in South Carolina and Georgia. On the vessel trip reporting side, again, we've got those three components. There's mobile, which uh, eTrips mobile version 2 works on tablets, uh, iPhones, Android phones, Windows 10 uh, laptops. Uh, it has an online component using the web form, and, which requires you to be online all the time, and it also has the file upload for, portion. Those, that, those kind of common themes of three ways to get the data in is going to come back in another two slides. There's also a, a whole section on lobster trap tag management, and maybe the more centralized piece is the safest management system. Uh, it's referred to uh, those who use it as just SMS, and it says partner admins there because that's the place where partners need to go in and manage. What are the species lists that are okay? What are the gear lists that are okay? What are all the background pieces that are, should be displayed to their fishermen for their permits? Um, and that interaction is a, uh, a piece of software that's, that's built and functions um, within the SAFIS system, but really relies on the data inputs and management and workload of all of the partners uh, to make sure that the right things are being, uh, being shown to their fishermen when their fishermen log into the end app. Um, on the redesign, the goals really are flexible, and the redesign has been... Uh, kind of cast a couple of different ways is, oh, we're going to have new tools at the end, and that's the, the last step. The big part of the redesign where it's been kind of talked about for a couple of years now has been an envisioning stage of what kind of flexible tools do we want, what general approaches should be there, what are the needs of the end users, and that took some time. The next step was really to change the database level approaches. Uh, the, and, and this graphic is trying to show where are we on development test instances, instances and where are we in the production status. And, and that, the, the outside world really cares about where we're at in the production status, but sometimes we uh, don't recognize all the work and progress that goes into getting up to that point. And so the recursive database design basically means it's flexible and you don't have to just collect the types of fields that have been defined 10, day, ten years ago. So that's a, a way to collect and store the data that's about a lot more flexible. Um, there's gear attributes, economic data fields, other species attributes, and the, uh, the species attributes might be it's standardly collected in pounds, but you also want numbers, and then you also might need, need another field to go along with that. The gear and economic attributes are functional in eTrips mobile version 2 right now, and we're working on updating the online tools to follow those same um, types of flexible uh, design and opportunities. Another portion is to provide a partner switchboard. And that's really in a way, through the web tool, to add and remove optional data elements to the form. And it rebuilds that form dynamically based on who your, what your partner is and what your, uh, what your permits are. This is like a geeky, exciting, excitable thing, but, when it, but this is the type of technology that enables one form to meet the same needs, whether you've got a state permit or you just have a federal permit in one region, or if you've got four permits across regions in different states. So this approach has taken a lot to kind of figure out, and there's a part of that in demonstration mode, which when we've shared with folks, uh, the other technical geeks tend to get excited about it, so uh, I get excited about it too. Um, the other items on the list, which are kind of ongoing in development and test, are consolidating the data processing, redesigning the online applications, and integrated, the re and integrated reporting, meaning universal trip ID. And just to give a better visual of what this really means, the current data processing, if you notice, the upload online and mobile, those three sections from a few slides ago, they go through their own kind of gearbox and processing. Because as ECCSP systems evolved over time, that processing was kind of developed and then run in parallel. 
While functional, it takes extensive programming to maintain consistent logic across all three areas. So you change one of them, then you got to go back and make sure the logic is exact, exactly right in the other, and then, oh yeah, well, so let's forget about this third piece. Future state would be different arrows and one set of gears. We're working on this. Uh, Karen Holmes and the software team is building the structures in the, in the database procedures to be able to have it come in one way, have it evaluated and looked at, go through the same set of gears and processing, and store that data in the central data warehouse, and then, store, and then be able to present that back out um, through, the, through the query systems. This takes a very complex project process and makes it look simple, but it's a big step forward in terms of overall programming efficiency uh, and the ability for the data flow to work right from a variety of third-party vendors, different database types, sharing the data back and forth between partner agencies uh, in the background. And so this is uh, just kind of an approach, a different graphic and a way to explain that to you guys that um, hopefully will we'll build some, some transparency of where we're at and where we're going. The next step of the redesign is really the integrated reporting. Uh, integrated reporting means different things to different people again. Um, one might be being able to send from your vessel the hail out, the tracking information via uh, VMS, which is more of a Gulf requirement or very few fisheries in, in the Atlantic, um, and your logbook. From the perspective of a fisherman, that, that's integrated reporting. From the perspective of where we're looking at it is a universal trip ID. That would be where if you submit a hail out or a pre-trip notification, it creates a, tr a trip identifier. When you submit, and it sends that back to the fisherman. Then when you submit your logbook, it has that same identifier. So you don't have to go through a series of database gymnastics to try and match up a hail out to a trip report based on a vessel, a date, a port, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, having universal trip ID, sharing that back and forth, being able to link biological sampling, port sampling, uh, trip reports, dealer reports, uh, tends to really, really help out. There's a lot of ac activities now where some of the best matching rates are close to like 80% between dealer reports and trip reports. And we want that number to go up uh, using a system like this, which um, was, to give credit where it's due, envisioned up in, in the Northeast in Garfo and, and uh, shared with us to, to help implement and, and extend into other regions. So this one's really in phase one of production. Uh, ACCSP is developing a hail out feature for eTrips mobile uh, version 2.1, so that's going to be to support the, the South Atlantic, or not support Seafire, but in the Gulf where they have a, a, a hail out trip requirement. Um, so those are all pieces of the safest redesign of integrated reporting, and another piece of that redesign is registration tracking, which Julie has been working on, so I'm going to pass that one back to her before we ask for questions on this area. Thanks, Jeff. So the registration tracking portion is the participant module design, which is the component of the database that handles the people, the permits, and the vessels. And one of the things that we are attempting to do in our new module is to incorporate a little bit more flexibility in the system. And this will allow for scenarios where I have my own individual permits, but I am also part of a corporation, and that corporation has permits. Um, it also allows for me to be part of one corporation over here where I am partnering with person A, but I'm also part of another corporation where I'm partnering with person B. Additionally, this will give us the flexibility for me to be able to be um, I happen to own a fleet of boats for four hire boats and I have various different captains that are responsible that I would like to have entering those data and so I have you know sub accounts where they're data entry accounts but they can only see 
certain data, the one, the data that they are entering, and then I can see all of the data as the data owner. Um, so those are the kinds of flexibilities that we're attempting to achieve. Um, however, we do recognize that the permitting systems at all of our partners vary greatly, um, especially at the federal level in the two regions. Um, the permitting systems are different, to say the least. Um, so what we have done is we convened a small group that has come together and created something that we think will work for everyone. And that, um, those scenarios and spreadsheets were distributed at the operations committee. Um, though each operations committee member has been tasked with taking all of that information back to their partner agency um, if they would like to engage in a webinar for further explanation they've been given that option and every agency has until the end of the year to provide some kind of response and we wanted to give that extensive amount of time because we realized that it's complex it can involve multiple staff at the agency level um, but it is going to be vitally important for us to all be on the same page with that moving forward uh, because once we do so we are not going to be able to go back easily and make changes um, so we wanted to let you know specifically about that particular aspect because there is a feedback loop on that one that is coming around the bend great any questions so far Jason Magnamy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wondering, so the uh, integrated um, stuff is super cool. Um, I'm wondering, so I, I get m most of it, I think. So it's kind of like it's the, you know, VTR e-trips with the dealer report, being able to kind of track things through. What about observer information? And then my follow, I see head nodding. And so my follow up to that is then does that conflict between the different um, discard calculation, maybe I'm up a level on that, but th there's some conflict on how discards are calculated. And I'm wondering if that causes a challenge for that aspect of the integrated reporting. That is a great question, Julie. Um, the real key with TMS is that it's going to be a phased in approach. And so while observer data is slated to eventually have the TMS universal ID tag, um, we are starting with what we consider to be the low hanging fruit. And that right now we're starting with, we're putting a universal ID on a hail out and then we're attaching it to the same trip. Um, the next step is to then, you know, take a trip and do a dealer report because those two are integrated. Um, as we move along, we do intend, <coughs> pardon me, to incorporate observers that are on the boat, um, also biological samples or recreational samples on the for hire side that are sampling at the docks. So the idea is to perpetuate the universal ID throughout all of those things, but implementation of those last end of the list is still way out there. So the answer to your question is, is it hasn't been discussed in detail yet. Yeah. She answered it, so are we ready to move on for more questions? Okay. Moving down our agenda, we now have our updates from the operations advisors. Uh, Nicole. Thank you, Jeff. There was a joint operations advisory committee meeting in September in Arlington. Um, in addition to talking about FY20 proposals and the funding step-down projection, as well as the 75-25 split, we discussed many other items. Um, I also wanted to give a quick shout out to Rob Watts for the lobster proposal. He was in a seat of heavy fire during that meeting and he responded very well to all of our questions and he did very well um, and we were very impressed with his ability to answer all of our questions. So I just wanted to mention him real quick. Um, but some of the other things that we discussed we were given um, a sheet that the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council had put together, an EVTR fact sheet, and this, the partners were asked to fill it out for their state, basically asking us um, what the status of EVTR requirements in our state were going to be. So for example, in Rhode Island, if you fill out an EVTR, you don't have to fill out 
a state logbook, uh, your EVTR will suffice for your reporting requirement. So the partners were asked to fill that out and we got responses from almost all states on that. We reviewed all the project expenditures to date. All the current projects looked good. There was one state that might underspend a little bit, but uh, we still weren't sure of that. They still had some bills to come in. We reviewed committee membership on all ACCSP committees, made some corrections to that, identified some gaps, um, particularly talked about the advisors committee, which Jerry will touch on next. We then received updates much to the same effect that you all have received today. Uh, reviewed all committee action items, which I'll get to next. Uh, got an update on the accountability work group, safest redesign, FISMA, the for hire workshop, MREP regional implementation plan, the fall data load and its progress, had a schedule, and then the FIS projects. We then had elections where I was um, voted in as chair, and Renee Zobel from New Hampshire is our new vice chair. And also wanted to thank Amy Dukes for her service as chair the last two years. She did a great job. And I'll pass it over to Jerry for the advisor's update. Thank you, Nicole. On behalf of the advisors, I would like to thank ASMFC, ACCSP, and the Coordinating Council for hosting the 78th annual meeting here at Newcastle. I would also like to once again, congratulate ACCSP's new director, Jeff, and deputy director, Julie, on their newly appointed positions. It has been a challenging past few years of dwindling advisor membership. This occurred for a variety of reasons, including weather-related events, health, travel, etc. However, one of the underlying reasons is that the purpose of the advisors, their mission and responsibilities, have not translated well for operations down to prospective candidates in part because of turnover in personnel and also not being familiar enough with the advisor's function so as to recruit and or recommend candidates for effective. Back in 2012, Ann McElhenton, Mike Buckle, and myself initiated the development of the advisor's guidelines available on the ACCSP website, which by the time it rolled out turned out to be a comprehensive piece of detailing mission, history, duties, responsibilities, and everything in between. At our most recent joint meeting between ops and advisors, we had good discussions about function, recruitment, and outreach, where we educated new ops members who ultimately will play a pivotal role in enhancing membership. As a result, we are hopeful that this will have a positive impact on membership, and I'm thankful for the time allotted for that discussion, and that under ACCSP's new management, positive things will happen. During this year's ranking, of fiscal year 20 proposals, both operations and advisors were pretty much together in their rankings of maintenance as well as new proposals. The one creating most discussion due to its $837,251 request was Maine's Managing 100% Lobster Harvesting Reporting, which was ranked fourth or last by the advisors. We must also comment on how well uh, Maine's representative had done in explaining why they needed that particular amount, what they can do with and without it. Voice recognition using Dragon Speech within Dockside Interceptor Application DIA ranked third. Use of geographic data and safest data sources to evaluate an aggregate landings commercial fishing management program ranked second. Safest expansion of SAFMC release and North Carolina DMF catch you later. Discard reporting applications ranked first. Eight of the nine maintenance proposals fell tightly ranked between the top of 8.25 maintenance and coordination of fisheries data dependent feeds to ACCSP from the state of Rhode Island, down to the eighth one being 7.25 electronic reporting and biological characterization of New Jersey commercial fisheries. The ninth one, portside commercial catch sampling and comparative bypass sampling for Atlantic herring, Atlantic mackerel, and Atlantic Manhattan fisheries ranked last with a score of 4.38. Both operations and advisors were in agreement regarding funding for priorities and the recommendations to the Coordinating Council. 
Throughout the year as chair, I use radio time to update fishers on progress made in various aspects of fisheries management, including key council decisions, advancement in electronic reporting, MRIP, APIS, striped bass concerns, as well as other fisheries that are currently pressured. This time is used primarily to reach out to the recreational and for higher sector, although commercial fisheries benefit as well. Lastly, the advisors held elections during their meeting at the joint session with the result being Fran Carp of Rhode Island, elected chair, and Ethan, excuse me, Ellen Gothel of New Hampshire, elected vice chair. At this time, I would like to extend congratulations and a hearty thank you for stepping up to the plate and having my back when needed. The advisors will be in good hands with both of these hardworking and dedicated members. After serving three terms as chairs, we'll pass the time to pass the gavel. So next year this time, Fran will be seated here addressing you. Until then, here are a few words she asked to relay since arranging for an open mic would be logistically problematic. I think Julie might have those. Thank you, Jerry. Are there any questions for, for Jerry or advisors? Julie, Julie oh, I'm Shepard. sorry, Julie. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, these are words that were sent by Fran Karp, the ACCSP advisor chair-elect. Anyone following in the role of ACCSP advisor chair behind Jerry Morgan has some pretty big shoes to fill, and I am thankful to Jerry for all of his wisdom and encouragement through the years. I have been a recreational advisor with the ACCSP since 2012 and have had the pleasure of listening to an amazing group of thinkers from both the advisors and operations committees. The group is passionate and committed to the work they do for fisheries. The advisory committee's main objective this upcoming year is to increase partner participation for both the recreational and commercial seats. I hope to increase the number of dedicated individuals on the committee and subcommittees who work hard to improve data collection and fisheries management through technological innovations and standards. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, Fran, for sharing your kind words and sharing your thoughts on prioritizing partner participation, participation in order to increase committee membership and Godspeed through your journey as the next advisor's chair. I would also like to thank everyone who afforded me the pleasure of serving as chair for the past several years and being there when needed. Nicole, just a moment. I, I do want to recognize Jerry for all of his work. Um, thank you for being a, a fantastic chair of the advisors. I could always count on you to be at the uh, Rec Tech meetings and other meetings. Uh, whether it was a, a webinar or in person and have thoughtful input and uh, you kept us going during the ops advisors meeting thinking of process and protocol and quorum and pulling people in uh, and, and really highlighting the need for uh, different approaches to keep the advisors uh, sorry to get advisors uh, nominated and to keep them engaged and so those were all uh, excellent points and we very much appreciate your uh, service to ECCSP and contributions. Okay, so next I'm going to go through some committee action items, and I will try to be brief as there are many of them. So for bio and bycatch, uh, both committees have a sampling inventory. Previously, that inventory has always been housed in Excel. It makes it difficult for version control, making it I'm sure it's up to date, and also it's not readily accessible by the public. So there's been an effort to incorporate that into the data warehouse application. This is currently on hold due to resource constraints um, and has been for a little while. So hopefully in the coming year, we can start to work on that again. For the biological review panel, there's a column in the biological matrix for resilience. The committee has struggled over the years on defining resilience, uh, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. So an effort, large effort, um, was conducted to define this in a quantitative way. Richard Cody, from previously from Florida, uh, had started this, put quite a bit of work into it. Mike Arrigo from the South Atlantic then picked it up and 
ran through a few examples for the committee and now we've broken up into small groups and we're going one species at a time through the biological matrix and filling out this resilience column. So it should be ready for the next round uh, next year. And then for the bycatch committee, Heather Connell and Jacob Boyd are going to coordinate a meeting to discuss moving forward with using citizen science. So we did have a date scheduled for this, uh, but it has to be rescheduled. So we're gonna work with Julia Bird, who's the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council Citizen Science Program Manager to get that on the books. For ComTech, uh, ComTech has had quite a few items, been very busy. A couple of items that they have completed, they had a webinar to review gear attributes and get feedback on the new gear, gear details um, in the warehouse. They also approved the traceability API and the process for seafood traceability. In progress are two small groups to be formed, one for electronic monitoring and setting the baseline data standards for that. And then the second one is on accountability. They've received nominations for both those groups, so those are both in progress. Also for ComTech, another small group to list out a potential, potential species for future conversion factor projects. So top, the top 10 species of interest have been compiled, um, and so they're gonna move forward with that. Two additional completed items are staff monitoring any developments in aquaculture reporting and also documenting the process for reporting known illegal catches and discards via safest applications. This is something that partners have been doing, but there was never a documented process. So now there is a document that lives on the ACCSP website for folks to look to. For the Information Systems Committee, the swipe card documentation was generalized and added to the ACCSP website. So, or is going to be, they have recommitted to this task. So this is yet to be completed. For valid ports, the states and NOAA are going to work together to determine which ports should be viewable in each state. So recommendation has been sent to ComTech on this, so this is done. The group is in progress of working with HMS to address how HMS sales are done on for higher trips. And for standard codes, standard codes is continually processing code change update requests. Um, if I bored you with the massive list of changes they've made, we'd be here for a while. Uh, they continually work to update codes in the warehouse. For RecTech, they have tabled the item to develop e-logbook standards. In progress, they're summarizing issues and possible approaches to improve PSEs. Also in progress, uh, updating the comprehensive for hire document with feedback received from the committee. And also in progress, ACCSP staff and committee will refine the methodology for APIS as validation prior to submission for peer review. So this will come up in the for hire data validation workshop. And with that, we can take any questions on committee action items. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Okay, so any questions? All right, Jeff, take us home. All right, thank you for your patience. I know we've kind of been throwing a bunch of things at you. Uh, the last couple of slides here are about the recreational program. Um, we've got a I'll talk a little bit on this slide and just let you know that things are coming and then get to the actual agenda items um, so that we can get on to the reception. Um, the Rec Tech Committee has kind of, has not met in a while. Uh, one of our things for this year is to revitalize the Rec Tech Committee. Uh, we've been down basically one and a half staff members on the four person rec team uh, since January 1. Uh, and so we were able to bring uh, a new person in, in mid-August and getting back on track with that. And as I mentioned earlier, we're looking to refill uh, my old slot. The activities for Rec Tech next year are really to continue working on a comprehensive for hire data collection plan. Uh, this whole point about using APIS as validation 
and working forward towards MRIP certification means that we're MRIP's really looking to the Atlantic states to figure out what is it that we want to propose, how is it going to work, and how can they evaluate that for certification. So we've got some homework to do uh, before we submit that to them for certification, but um, bringing the RecTech committee back, uh, back into higher activity levels will be a good thing to move that way. Um, along those same lines, with the initiatives of, of CFIRE and implement, implementation of the South Atlantic and Gulf this year, it's really kind of calling, and MREP has requested that um, all of the regions, uh, but our recreational implementation plan was developed in 2016 and approved in 2017, so they're looking for a, a revision of that in the next year, so that's on our list. Um, so the four hire workshop summary, if we can go to the, the next slide. This is a workshop that's purpose was really to evaluate minimum requirements and implementation challenge for the future comprehensive for hire data collection program. Spurred on by a bunch of new logbook programs and the need for data validation, estimation, and uh, kind of standardized procedures. This workshop was uh, very well attended. We had over 50 people from uh, all over the country, fisheries survey design, data collection, uh, estimation, consultants, et cetera. Um, it, we, were, we did meet in July, and we're still drafting that report for steering committee review, but the plan is to get that done, the steering committee approve it, and get that out before the end of the year. In terms of what the workshop overall talked about and some of their results, the terms of reference were really to characterize methods of current for hire data collection, uh, the second one was recommend issues to be addressed in a separate for hire telephone survey peer review. So that survey component is not yet certified and MRIP is looking forward to go, taking that to peer review. Those two items we got a lot of information and clarity on and that was fantastic. Uh, the last two items of recommending minimum required elements and providing direction on catch estimation approaches uh, are areas that probably need a little bit more work. but. Um, we recognize the need for some national sideboards on what the design elements could and should be with regional flexibility, and the group did support a blend of federal logbooks and state water effort survey methods along with some sort of validation. That it, in itself was a good process uh, that was going forward and the statisticians were able to comment on the math. So um, having these different data collection pieces is wonderful, but it only really fits into what the MRIP estimation process is if you have the math right of which vessels are in which frame, how do the data go together, and can you add the pieces of a logbook and a state vessel together at the end of the day. So if you've got two vessels that are in the same, same marina but different slips, one fills out a federal logbook, the other one Gives, does the, the traditional FHTS effort survey like, um, at the end of, and they both get intercepted by the, by the dockside survey at the end of the year, can you come up with believable statistics on how each group of those get expanded? That math hasn't been worked out, but the statisticians told us that uh, there's a lot of viable options uh, depending on the reporting compliance rate, the validation surveys, and how if the matching methods are high enough. So even this ties back to that whole universal trip ID uh, trip matching piece and, and how those data collection systems work. So this is a, the next graphic is one you saw before. It's basically the idea of along the top is if you have uh, a logbook frame uh, in, in kind of the blue on the water piece and uh, top left and the APIS val or some sort of onshore validation uh, on the land on the green on the right. Those get combined into the orange box on top for kind of the logbook vessel estimate. Uh, if you take the path along the bottom, that's an effort survey on the bottom left. The same kind of um, survey catch frame that makes the small orange box uh, in the middle, and if it all works out right, then those two are additive and make the larger box, which is comprehensive um, for higher catch and effort statistics. So that's the goal, 
And the next slide is just a recognition of a process that uh, MREP has been putting forth in many different venues for a long time, and that is that uh, the process includes first completing the design and MREP certification of the methodology, to use logbooks with a catch survey where possible, to allow effort survey methods where logbooks are not practicable, and to develop an appropriate calculation approach for the combined estimates. Once that piece is done, which is big, then there would need a benchmarking period for the new method and a calibration to the historical data. So this is going to be a long-term process, but it's one that we're invested in and uh, from working and speaking with MREP, they're certainly open to, to uh, options and hearing from us on, on approaches to go. In the meantime, there are surveys that need to be done uh, this year and next year maintaining the current methodologies. And so good news on the four hired telephone survey state conduct. Um, we have agreement from MRIP to move forward. We have approved budgets and we are now drafting the new state agreements that will begin in January of 2020. Um, we have been doing this data collection with functional software in three states for the all of 2019, uh, Maine, North Carolina, and Georgia, and we've been meeting our data uh, delivery timelines for that survey so far. And so that sets, us, sets the stage for next year, and we have a, a thumbs up, so at this point, uh, to move forward with a four hire telephone survey and large pelagic telephone survey. Uh, via state conduct, and that is in the new, uh, in the budgets that you got, your staff all help prepare, and we're excited to move forward with that. Um, the other ongoing data collection, and we are getting close to the end, is an uh, update on APIS state conduct. Um, again, uh, we, the overall intercepts have gone up 25% since you were all became more fully involved in this process and the responsible party for the field data collection since 2016. That's about a 3% increase from last year while we moved to the tablet data collection and that shows stable or increasing interview rates, low edit rates, a good data review, and once again, we're delivering data to NOAA five days earlier each month. Those five days are critical for their processing and internal data review before releasing it 45 days after the end of the wave. So those are all pretty success, successful stories about our interaction and the partner uh, approach to doing this. It does support one of the MRIP electronic reporting roadmap goals, which is getting field staff to use uh, electronic tools. They have other approaches uh, that, are, that are in the pipeline. And um, again, just to highlight uh, the Julie's point on the tablets and the FIS software, we are uh, sharing that as developed and the, all the costs will, will not be re-incurred down there uh, for them to, to use the, the Dockside tablet application. And again, just to be fun and end with a graph, uh, the big picture here is uh, the, the green bars are 2018, the blue bars are 2019, each state is represented. But overall productivity, meaning interviews per assignment, has gone up from 8.7 to 9.3. In most cases, it's gone up a bit. There was a lot of concern before we put tablets in the field that, oh, the tablets are going to slow us down. We're not going to get as many interviews. We're not going to be able to get this done. We might drop them in the water. We only had two or three tablets out of 160 that were broken this year, and then we had enough reserves in place that it didn't affect data collection. Um, so there were, there were more errors with scheduling mistakes than there were with tablet, tablets misfunctioning. Um, and so uh, the big picture here is a lot of improvements in all of the states. Um, the next slide is another way to measure productivity and it's the eligible angler uh, percentage interviewed uh, by year. So the good news here is that between 2018 and 2019 that hovered right around 60%. Uh, and this is a, a little bit more fair measure of sometimes you have a bad weather day, there's nobody at the site, but this is how well is, are the staff doing and are the tools, uh, the tablet tools, data collection tools doing to capture the activity of those who are on site when you're there. So in general, 60% of the people that finish a fishing trip during an APIS assignment are completing an interview. 
Um, in most cases, it's kind of even or up from last year, and there are a few cases uh, where it's gone down from last year. We're not entirely sure which factors uh, have contributed to that. It might be staff turnover and training. It might be pulses in overall fishing levels. It might just be comfort with the technology. Uh, it's kind of hard to say, but uh, again, it's a, um, it's a good thing that we're getting that level of interaction and participation with the fishermen and that's really a, a, a blessing of, of your staff and how you're able to, they're able to work with your anglers. Um, with that, are there questions on the recreational updates and components? Seeing none. Um, thank you for your patience. I hope this was helpful. I want to invite anybody interested uh, to give kind of the reporting tools and the APIS tablet a test drive. We will have a laptop and a tablet out at the ACCSP state, uh, table all day tomorrow and, and probably tonight if you need it. Uh, but I appreciate the, uh, the time and the attention today. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, you guys, that just so much going on, and we really appreciate your efforts. And with that, do I have any objection to a motion to adjourn? Looks like I don't. Consider us adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Before everyone wanders out, tonight's reception is you go past the re um, reception desk or the registration desk, and it's on your left-hand side before you get to the bar starting at 6 o'clock.